So this is going to be more of a do good 101 for everyone, just a bit of overview of the operation and geology, a few rock pictures at the end, and we'll, we'll go from there for questions at the end. So I've been with MMG on and off for about seven years, but I'm um, at Dougald for the last 18 months. But um, the key thing is that I, the work I've done has been built off many people before me, so especially over the last uh, few years since 2017. So I need to thank Sean Neal, who's the geology superintendent at Dougald River. He's been instrumental in um, incorporating all body knowledge back into the my geology team over the last few years. Peter, who's hiding behind the pillar over there. He's been doing his structural PhD over the last few years. He's been instrumental, instrumental in um, our understanding of the structures of Dougald River. Uh, Marcus Tomkinson and Brett Davies, their work over many, many years, um, particularly in 2017, uh, they were key in initiating what we called the DROC study, the Dougald River All Body Knowledge Study. So that was a 12 month study between the mine site geologists and the exploration geologists that were in Melbourne. They pulled their resources together and did this 12 month study. And obviously there's numerous people that I can't go into now. So just a quick overview, we're a stone throw from uh, Cloncurry, predominantly a zinc, lead and silver mine, but there are occurrences of uh, copper, gold, um, cobalt and molly in the hanging wall. And I'll talk a bit, bit about those later in the prezo. Uh, deposit style, I would aim to say it's a slate hosted, shear zone controlled base metal deposit. Not a fan of pigeonholing it at the moment because we still heaps we don't understand. ZX in inverted commas there, but there's similarities with BHT style and SCAN um, features to the deposit. Uh, processing wise and mining, it's a, it's underground mine, so it's overstoking and we produce a zinc concentrate and lead con as well with credits. You can see up in the top corner there, um, it's essentially 60 million tonnes at 12.2% zinc, but at the moment the deposit is open to the north and south and at depth, so there's huge potential to increase the resource further. Uh, throughput is 1.8 million tonnes per annum. Uh, metal concentrate is 170,000 um, tonnes per annum. We've still got a 20-year mine life. Uh, we're in the top 10 uh, global zinc producers and we've just reached our million tonne concentrate milestone just recently, the last few weeks. And of course, you can see some core photos there and I'll go into that a bit more depth later on in the talk. Just a quick uh, view of the history of the Dougal River. Uh, project. So uh, Paul did mention this yesterday and it's all been snipped off there on that um, there unfortunately but essentially 1936 was the first drill hole that was sunk into the into the deposit and um, without going through everything else MMG took it up in 20, uh, 2009 and it went into operation in um, 2017 um, and since then we've done the all-body knowledge study and um, continue to try and put all-body knowledge back into back into the operation, the models that we do and work on growth and prediction studies. Um, also, you may note there that it took 80 years from the first drill hole to actual mining of the deposit. So that's a pretty significant um, chunk of time there. Uh, regional geology, this is a bit of a plug for the uh, deposit atlas. So there you go, guys. Um, <laughs> the uh, regional map there. So we're in the Mary Kathleen domain there in the purple. So the image to the left, so you can see that um, Blue spot in the middle is Dugard River. So it's a um, zinc mine in copper country, essentially. We've got the copper mountain, copper gold um, resources that sit around us. Uh, the map to the, to the right is from Peter. So you can actually see um, it's, it's a blow up of the widest part of the Mary Kathleen domain. You can see in the brown as you come up uh, through to the south to the north, this is the Mount Rosebury Schiss. So it's essentially a five kilometer wide high, sh high strain zone. And as you come up to this orange um, orange blob in here, so this is 10 kilometres or 12 kilometres, this is the Napdale Quartz site and Dougal River is tucked into the eastern side of that. So just a bit more of a blow up in here. This was just to show the Napdale Quartz site in the brown in here, Dougal River tucked into the eastern side and all these green is the, um, or are the um, Copper Mountain uh, resources around us. Uh, the other map to the right is a MMG map. The green is the Napdale Quartz site. Uh, the blues and the red are the slate and schist that host Dougald River. So you can actually see Dougald River on the eastern margin there. All the black dots represent our drill holes that we've completed. And the, the slates that sit on the western margin, the Napdales are equivalent to what we see on the, on the eastern side. And you can see our tenement package there. Most of those mine leases, there's this one EPM just tucked in to the western side of um, Dougald River. 
So just a bit more of a blow up of a map. This is just to show Dougald River load here in pink that tracks uh, to the northwest. In the uh, in the blue is the Lady Clare Dolomite. So that's a foot, we call it footwall limestone. Anything in um, grey and orange in here are the slate, host slates and the schists. And then we come into the hanging wall calcosilicates and there's mafic porphyry, the Sicilon contact. And then we've got the Napdale quartz site uh, with a large thrust contact between the calcosilicates and quartz site. So there's just a strat column there to the um, to the right there. So you can see from the blues again, similar coloration. You come up from uh, dolomites into banded um, banded carbonate and slates, and then you come into the ore zone. Ore zones split out into numerous different ore textures, uh, mainly breccias and stringer mineralization. There's a bit of banded ore, and I'll show you images of those afterwards. Uh, Essentially, everywhere we go, we see this hanging wall shear zone. So it's variably graphitic. It can be a millimeter, millimeter wide, is it like a mirror sheen finish? But then it can blow out to like a ten meter wide uh, graphitic um, gougy zone with multiple strands to it, and that can sit just on the hanging wall all body contact, or sit ten meters outwards, and it can even cut into the all body itself. So as we come out to the hanging wall of the ore body, we get the massive uh, black slates. And then as we head to the calcellic contact, we start to get phyllites and uh, mica schist with mitre garnets. We have the mafic porphyry, which sits on the contact. I used to think it was quite uh, potty and um, pinched and swelled, but I think it's actually quite extensive along that whole contact. And then we go into the calcellicates, which are just uh, various biotite, garnet schists and um, scapolite schists. And then we go back into the quartzite. And just know I've said hanging wall to foot wall, but just um, bear in mind on the next slide, everything's been turned over. So mining wise, I have to do it this way, but geology, it's quartzite's the oldest, uh, dolomite's the, the youngest. So this is idolized uh, cross section, very similar to what Derek was showing yesterday. But uh, it's just to show that that eastern limb of the slates is actually overturned. So it's a Nap Napdale antiform. So everything from the Napdale thrust to the west, Young's that way. And from the thrust going back to the east, it youngs back this way as well. Uh, just what it looks like in outcrop. So it's probably world-class, you know, outcropping deposit. So you see this vegetation anomaly is, is quite extensive over two kilometres. Um, the only reason it stops is because I suspect that the oil body plunges to the north and south, but um, not enough drilling to support that. Um, certainly the Gossens look uh, are quite well developed on surface and certainly you get these um, zinc copper weeds. Um, around the place as well, which donate the uh, the Gossen area. So this image on the right, so that's looking to the north and to me is to the west. So if you keep that in mind, this is a long section looking to the west. So north is to the right. Uh, that yellow polygon is the low grade wireframe, which is greater than 1% zinc. And you can see it's got some sharp margins and it's open to the bottom. That's just because the way we've done it in the leaf frog, but essentially the deposit is open in all directions. Uh, just mining-wise, you can see in the uh, maroon poly, uh, poly lines, we just have that as um, just to figure out where we are in the mine. So, for example, all these it's 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, just to help us um, locate ourselves within the mine. You'll actually notice there there's actually two declines in the mine. So we've actually got one for the north mine and one for the south mine. The south mine is the main producer at the moment. It's quite thick, uh, 10 to 20 metres thick, the ore is there. Whereas the north mine is still high grade, but it's five metres or less. So we exploit the um, south mine and supplement with shallower resources. But again, everything's still open, so that could change with time. Uh, as I've just mentioned, the north mine is still high grade. So we'll turn that off for you, Rick. Uh, it's, so it's less than five metres thick, but in the north mine, the ore body becomes quite vertical and it pinches and swells, so it can be quite... Um, quite difficult for mining and tracking with development. Whereas if you go to the south mine, the ore body flattens out to uh, moderate west dipping, and it can be 10 to 20 metres, but it can even be much, much thicker. Uh, what we see in the south mine is a lot more brecciation, a lot more folding. There's just a lot more that's happening there. You can sort of see in this um, schematic here, this cross section looking to the north into the page. Um, it's from 2015, so it's a little bit outdated. But you can sort of see just, just for this case, the dark gray and the pale gray, just, just picture it as slates. And you can see in the pale orange that the actual ore body transects the, the slate package. In the purples here, you can actually see the 
hanging wall shear zones they actually do split and merge and we do have um, we do have a hanging wall lens as well which sort of follows the trend of that um, hanging wall lens and the copper mineralization is sort of not really well shown in here but it will sit in the between the hanging wall shear and the calc silicate contact so just a few models there um, since uh, since the 80s uh, people have looked at it as a SEDEX style deposit or a structurally upgraded SEDEX deposit, but um, work done in the late 90s suggests it's an epigenetic deposit solely governed by the shear zone. So I'll show you some images. Now, so um, so this is what the massive ore looks like. Usually um, the massive um, sphalerite breccias will have milled class in them. I know I've got some better pictures to show you shortly. Um, we do get slaty breccia, which is essentially just a slate host, which is broken up, cemented by sulfides, um, usually sphalerite, big hanging carbonate, pyrotite as well. The banded ore is, um, is essentially what it described as banded, mainly seen in the north mine, sphalerite rich, you do get coarse pyrite with it, and bits of galena. And as you head outwards from the deposit, you get um, string of sulfide material, which is pyrite and pyrotite. Um, unfortunately, you can replace the sphalerite in this with pyrotite, and you do get the same textures, and we do see a lot of that in the south mine. So time for some nice core pictures. So this is what the banded ore looks like. Um, and this is what typically we see in the north mine. You do get minor breccias, but not typically. It's usually this banded, banded ore. So mainly sphalerite, you get this coarse pyrite with it. And you can see that in places it's dismembered, like this pyrite band here. Even in here, you can actually see there's evidence of folding. So this is what the sort of textures were deemed as SEDEX, which is up for debate. Uh, these massive breccias, these are the milled breccias. So you actually get classes of carbonate, feldspar, quartz, and this bottom one down here is actually fluorite. So you actually do get a lot of fluorite class in the middle of the high grade ore. Just some more core photos. So here's some more banded ore here on the left hand side. Um, here's your more typical um, massive sulfide. So you can get we still call them massive sulfide um, breccias, but you just don't see the class. So you can actually see there's a different coloration in the sulfides in here. And um, you do get quite a bit of carbonate as well. Here's pyrotype brexture in here with all these shingle brexture type class. And certainly the brexures are polyphasal as well. So you do get these late stage carbonate um, brexures as well that come through particularly in the foot wall. So you can see in here that these are uh, essentially massive sulfide class. Uh, here you've got a mix of pyrotite carbonate brexures and you can see in here some of the slate class there super angular they get like fish hook type textures and some of them look like they've just opened up into into space um pyroton carbonate occur throughout the whole parogenesis of the deposit and i can't talk about it in depth at this point but um essentially anytime a spot opens up in the in the rock mass you'll see carbonate and pyrotite fill the space um, and certainly these distribution of ore textures are important for us for the resource modeling, but also in the north mine between drill holes, if we're unsure and we just model it as massive ore, then we go into the mine and see these more pyrotype breaches, it becomes an issue. Uh, there's quite a lot of manganese in the ore as well, and it's in the sphalerite lattice, so there's not much you can do about it, and in the carbonates. So just some more pretty rock pitches. So this is fine grain banded uh, pyrite. And this is what was deemed as the SEDEX texture in the 90s. So you see this really fine grain pyrite. So probably no arguments there, but then you sort of start getting this um, recrystallized re coarser pyrite material. In here, you can see two massive sulfide. This is the uh, pyrotype breccias up here. And then you come down here and see the um, sphalerite breccias with pyrite in them. In here, this is probably one of my favorite pictures. This is sphalerite with galena down the bottom goes up into um, sphalerite ores, and then you've got pyrotite above. So this is quite a, a distinct shearing texture in the ore body. More shearing textures here with the pyrite, pyrotite, carbonate, and then some more atypical or typical um, slaty breccia material with sphalerite and carbonate. Just a, an example of all these ore textures in play. So um, that's one meter in a drill hole. And I just took it for the picture of the banded ore at the bottom, but you can see you got like get slaty breccias above. And then uh, you do get like half a meter of barren slate. Then you go into the banded ore textures and then believe it or not, after 90 meters, you go into massive ore textures. 
So when we drill in these holes and you're doing our interpretations, we find it quite difficult to try and um, pull apart these ore textures and uh, predict with the drill spacings that we have um, what we're going to see. And we've found that really dense drill spacing is the only way to go because the ore body is so variable. So certainly we get a good grasp on uh, what's happening, but then as soon as we go underground and start to develop, it, it all changes. So you sort of see in here in one of the cuts underground, you get all these folding textures down here in Atom Tech uh, photogrammetry, photogrammetry images. Um, you can see these quartz veins. Um, we do have a lot of internal quartz pods in the deposit as well. Um, you know, for example, if you drill through the middle of where these two pinch out in here, you'll say there's no no internal waste, but then you go and mine it, and then you get these, you know, sets of uh, quartz quartz lenses in the middle of the deposit. And this was just another example here, just between 20, uh, 2009 and uh, 2014, just the out of your wide drill spacing, it looks pretty tram track, you connect it all up, looks pretty good, but then once you do more detailed drilling, you actually see there's all these offset, you know, shallow dipping west structures, there's a few more what we call formational steep structures and the deposits a lot more complex and variable than we thought. So what we have is that we've really got to be on top of our drill spacing um, and the interpretations between those holes and the complexities arise from when we do those uh, dense drill spaces. Because when you do it on wide space, it doesn't look as bad. When you go into um, the denser spacing, that's when you see the, the problems. And what we're trying to do is um, with our all body knowledge is to get a bit of prediction into what the ore is doing in the structures and also the ground conditions, deleterious elements um, and even growth opportunities. Uh, Peter's gonna talk about this in, his, in the next talk, but um, we really wanna work on our photogrammetry to get the most out of the data that we can. So we try to capture every cut uh, possible. So we have a huge database there of um, um, photogrammetry data and it's just figuring out what the, what the best data is to capture from that. So. But if we haven't caught it properly at the first steps, well, we're going to have issues. Uh, a bit about the copper. So the copper does sit in the hanging wall, um, predominantly chalk pyrite. Um, it sits, it's quite variable where it sits. It sits in the slates, into the phyllites, mica schist, and even into the mafic porphyry. So it's got a wider dis distribution than the, than the zinc does. There's been numerous studies done in the past, but um, the copper's quite sp sporadic and of low volume in the issue with Dougal River is because it's a zinc mine. Uh, when people have drilled it in the past and seen copper, they don't sample it because we're a zinc mine and stopping drill holes before the copper horizon. So it's a bit of an issue now to go back and model it and then to resample. So, but with our 3000 more underground holes now, we're working on to predict where the copper should be, extend the holes and the plan for next year is to get a lot of the old core out and start to resample these. Um, and then the resource there from 2019 is 8.7 million tonnes of 1.6% copper, but that's not a true reflection of what actually is there. Um, it's, there's a core tray down the bottom here and it's snipped off in the slide here on the, on the projector, but there's a metre of uh, massive um, chuck pyrite brecture there. So it's one metre of 14% copper, 9.5 grams per tonne gold, 25 grams silver and nearly 400 ppm of cobalt. So in some places, it's quite significant, these um, copper resources. So it would be really good to get a handle on what they, what they actually mean. And the beauty of it is, it's seen it's right in the near hanging wall. We've already got infrastructure there. It's not going to take much to get out there and get it if we can prove it up. So this is a bit of uh, current work we're going to do in some future work. So we've got many unknowns. We've only just got into operations. So geology sort of been on the back burner. But with um, myself, Peter and Sean on site working away, we really want to uh, build up our geological toolkit so it can help us with the mine and with growth opportunities. Um, sounds a bit trivial, but we want to embed a senior resource geologist on site into the team because in the past it's been disconnected off site. So what we want to do is have them on site so they can have the current geology into the model as possible. And as you can see with all those variations in all textures, internal waste, predicting the grade is our you know, number one key um, goal. Uh, just a few studies we've got on at the moment. So obviously Peter's a year and a half into his structural PhD study and we talk about the photogrammetry up to this. Uh, Pro UQ um, last month about doing some textual studies on um, some of the zinc mineralization and perhaps some critical metals at Dougal River. And uh, the, 
I hope Courtney's watching, but um, we're working on getting the high logger, um, get some core done and donate some core as well. So, And then there's plenty of other future studies. There's graphite. I'd like to understand what the graphite's doing at the deposit. It's a geochron. We don't know it, pretty much anything about it. Alteration mapping. So plenty to talk about in the future. So thank you very much. Awesome, Corey. There are some uh, beautiful textures there. Yeah. Dougal's giving Mount Isa a run for pretty cool. <laughs> um, any questions? Up the back there. Hey, Corey, just one pillar. Okay. Um, you mentioned at the start there was um, BHT and SCARN affinities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you seeing spessartines and um, pyroxenes? Well, there's, there's certain characteristics. I can't say too much more, but there's certainly a lot of... Um, the problem is it looks like there's a lot of overprinting textures as well. Um, certainly one thing I didn't mention was the, uh, the ore deposit atlas or the deposit atlas these guys have put together, Rick and Paul and Nathan. It's got a lot of information about the alteration of parogenesis and the structural geology I didn't have time to get into. So have a read at that and you'll find a lot more wealth of information in there. We've got a couple of questions online. Sure. All right, Peter McGoldrick would like to know, he says, great talk, good job. Can you speak about lead distribution relative to zinc and copper? Yeah, so in the South Mine, it's, um, it occurs in those um, massive breccias, but also in the foot wall carbonate breccias, there's a lot, um, zinc can be like one to 2%, but you actually can get you know 4% lead with quite a lot of silver as well. So it's actually quite separate. So it seems to be there's a late carbonate brecciation event as well. Um, certainly in some of the banded ore where you see it folding, you can see um, galena in certain bands. So it's not uniform throughout the deposit. So. All right, we've got one more from Sam Spinks at Zyro. Another one, great talk. Are there any trace element anomalies that are decoupled between the pyrotite and the pyrite? Uh, certainly something I want to look at. It's certainly on the wish list to do, so yeah. Bruce has got a question up the back. You mentioned to really understand the ore body, you need close space drilling. Mm -hmm. How close? Uh, we do 20 by 15. And even then when it's a bit more complex, we do 20 by 10 just to tighten it up a bit. In some really key stope areas, so yeah, quite dense. Yep, thanks. 